God bless you, beloved. This is Bishop Anderson coming live to you from Bishop Corner. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let the redeem of the Lord say so. It's good to be back here to rebroadcast with Bishop Corner on this evening. We're going to continue on our subject, Lord, teach us to pray. And truly, beloved, prayer is something that a person or a saint of God or, or people, a person that wants to be saved, need to learn how to pray. So, the disciples of Jesus, after no doubt hearing the prayers of, the, of their Savior, they must have touched their heart in so much that they wanted to learn how to pray. Just like John's disciples had taught his disciples how to pray. And that's what the subject that we're going to be dealing with to this evening. Maybe Lord's will for the next few weeks on how to pray. Lord teach me how to pray. Even as John told his disciples how to pray. Let us bow our hearts in a word of prayer before we go into a word on this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for the word, it does the upright good in heart. And Lord, as we attempt to continue to teach on learning how to pray, for the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Lord God, just touch our hearts to speak to the hearts of the people, and let your word be sown in good ground so that they bring forth fruit, and that the fruit of your word may remain. For we ask it in Christ's name. And for your strength and for your grace we pray. Amen and thank you God. Lord teach us to pray. We just thank God just for this opportunity to come live again to, I'm rebroadcasting by the way, uh, from Bishop Corner. I'm Bishop James F. Anderson Jr. Presiding Prelate of New Shower Holy Hands Hill Ministry. Where yours truly is the presiding prelate of my wife, Pastor Beverly Anderson, my lovely wife for 45 years. She is the pastor. And we just thank God for this medium that we can live stream and uh, talk to the live streaming audience um, on the subjects that God has placed on our hearts. But he told Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter asked, answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you more than these. And he told them to feed the sheep and he said that Jesus said it to Peter again. He told him to feed his lamb. And the third time he said, Peter got a little frustrated. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And this is our, our mandate is to feed the people of God, those who want to eat. You know, the songwriter said, come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. You can eat at or feast at Jesus' table all the time. For he who fed the multitude he turned the water into wine, for the Master's calling now, come and die. And that's what basically, beloved, that we're going to be teaching on the Word of God, and whosoever will, whosoever have a will to hear the Word of God, let him come and die. On the sign behind me is from Matthew, the 6th chapter, to 10th to the 13th verse, when the disciples asked to learn how to pray, Jesus said to this man that you should pray, and we have an acronym, acronym in the back for prayer. The P stands for, uh, for praise. You want to praise God for who He is. And also you want to praise Him for what He's done. Enter into, us with thanks, into, enter to, into His courts with thanksgiving. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving. And in His courts with praise. Know ye that the Lord He is God. He is, it is He that has made us and not we ourselves. Then the second thing, as far as the acronym of prayer, is R, and R stands for repent. You want to repent, repent of the sins that we've committed, because we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And we ought to repent for the commands that we did not obey when the Lord spoke to our hearts. And in that R, you know, it says, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the A in it stands for, we ask God and we pray for others. We pray for the needs of others. We don't start off in prayer asking for me, me, me. You know, but we pray for others that God will heal our nation. If my people 
that are called by my name will just humble themselves and pray. Turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. He said, then I will hear, hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Just give us this day our daily bread. And the why stands for yield. You want to yield your will over to the will of the Father. Prayer. Prayer changes things. Prayer is the key to the kingdom. And your faith and your prayers to God will unlock the door. Now, this is a study that we're going to be doing on prayer. And in John 14 and 6, Jesus says, For no man can come unto the Father but by him. And this is like one of the things that I wanted to really point out um, in the lessons. That when you come to the Lord, you want to come to him in prayer, in heartfelt prayer. You want to come to the Father in Jesus' name. For Jesus is our mediator between God and man. The songwriter said, Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain, but he, his blood washes white as snow. When the first church was formed on the day of Pentecost, they told, they told those that wanted to receive Christ into their life to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remissions of your sins. So Jesus can remit or forgive us for our sins. So when we come before the throne of God, we want to come in the name of Jesus. You don't want to come in your own as your own representative before a holy, righteous judge. But because, because Jesus is our mediator between God and man. You know, so we come to God just like that, with an open heart, and we come in the name of Jesus because Jesus is our mediator. We could not never stand before a righteous God in our own self. The scripture says that our lives are supposed to be hid in Christ and God. And when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we appear also with him in glory. So John, it's, for, it's so important, beloved, that we pray in the name of Jesus. Uh, think about Exodus and how when God was going to get the mass exodus of the children of Israel, they had to kill a three of lamb and put the blood over the lentils of the door and over the posts of the door. And when the death angel seen the blood, because he was coming for all the firstborn that were in Egypt, and those that didn't have the, their house covered in the blood, which represents your body, because your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which God liveth in us, if the death angel seen the blood, he would pass over. And that's what Jesus is. His blood atoned for our sins. So when we come to God in prayer, beloved, you have to come in the name of Jesus. For the Bible says there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved but by the name of Jesus. And that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory and honor of God. And in St. John, the 10th chapter, it's Jesus, the first verse, it says, All that ever came before him was thieves and robbers, because at that time, Jesus had not died on the cross. And even at the day of judgment, those that have accepted Christ and try to come to God another way, the Bible says, you're a thief and a robber. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now yesterday we had talked about Daniel and this is what I want to point out. Daniel was a praying man and his enemies fought him tooth and nail. They were jealous because Daniel was in charge of the three president that presidents that King Darius had set over his over his um, nation. The Jews was in, in, in captivity because of their sins, but Daniel found favor in the eyesight of King Darius. Over all the 120 princes that he had, and the 120 princes reminded me of the 120 that was up in the upper room, you had the 120 princes, and you had the three presidents, who Daniel was the number one honcho. But he prayed three times a day, beloved, 
And even though the presidents and the princes had deceived uh, King Darius to to let no one pray to their God for 30 days, they were setting Daniel up because they knew that they could find no accusation, no accusation in Daniel's life except it was in his God. And that's in Daniel's the sixth chapter. So they could count on Daniel to pray. Alright? And Daniel prayed. And when the king found out that Daniel was praying to God for the for the um, decree was that he that no one could pray to God for thirty days and if they wanted anything they had to ask from King Darius. His heart was his heart was hurt because he because he loved Daniel. But because Daniel was a praying man, God worked in the midst of that. So even in the midst of being cast into the lion's den, Daniel still didn't stop praying, beloved. He prayed three times a day. So the last time we were together, I'm not gonna summarize every time that we meet, but this is one thing that I want to point out in the lessons of that. The first portion of Jesus teaching them how to pray, beloved. One thing that he, one thing that he first did, beloved. He said, "After this man, I pray ye, Abba, Father, which are in heaven." And it's the Abba, Father, beloved, that touched my heart. We pray to God, our Father, and that, I, I like to use the acronyms of the acronym for Father will be this, beloved. He was a faithful, a father needs to be faithful to his family. And God is faithful to us, beloved. So when we pray to God, we go to God as our Father. And not only is He our Father, but He's in up in heaven, even though He's on the presence. But His throne is in heaven. And the earth is His footstool. <laughs> yeah. Our Father is in heaven. So as a father, the A stands for he's authoritative. God has given that same authority to the father. The man, the father, the husband is the head of the wife, is the head of the family. Just like Christ is the head of the church. And God the Father is head of Christ, which is the, which is the body, his, a body of believers, beloved. So the father has authority to govern to manage, to supervise, to protect, to provide for his family. The T and Father stands for he can be trusted to protect and to teach and to guide his family. And we can trust in God our Heavenly Father. So in the first opening statement of Abba Father, this is what Christ is saying to us. God has to be recognized as your Father. And the H stands for He's to be honored. For holy or hollow be thy name. You know, thy kingdom come. He has a king, kingdom. So he is to be honored. And just like the natural father, he is to be honored. And even so much so, much so with God. We want to honor God, the Bible says, with all your substance. In, in Romans, the 12th chapter, it says, you know, present your body a living sacrifice, holding and kept upon to God which is your reasonable service. And in Exodus 20 and 12, one of the, the uh, Ten Commandments, it says that you ought to honor your mother and father that your days might be long upon the earth. The Sixth Commandment of the Ten, the first five was to God, or vertically, the second five was to relationship with each other, with mankind. And it said in the sixth commandment, you ought to honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long upon the earth. And that was a commandment with promise, okay? So we ought to honor our father. The E stands for he, he enriches us with his knowledge, with his wisdom. And the Bible said how you ought to train a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from the way. And the R in Father stands for he's reliable. A father is reliable, a father is rest is resourceful, and he can and his family can count on him. 
just like we can count on our Heavenly Father. If our Heavenly Father can take care of the sparrows, can He take care of you and I? So He is to provide for us, He is resourceful, and He is, protect, and he is to protect His family. So our Father, which are in heaven, and God can't be your Father, beloveds, if you're not His child. Now, if you're not his child, this is what the Bible calls you. He calls you a bastard and not a son. Because if you are his children, beloved, the Bible says that he chastened those in whom he loved. And if you can't receive correction or chastisement, especially when you go out of the will of God, the Bible calls you a bastard and not a son or a daughter. So, and also Jesus honored his father. In Luke 2 and 49, he said, I always do those things that are pleasing to my father. So when you read the New Testament, it basically, beloved, what you see is Jesus uh, personifying, explaining unto us more clearly that God is our heavenly father. God is not a stepdad, he's my heavenly father. And yesterday I had talked about my earthly father, how God became my father, when even though I had a male father figure in my home, I didn't have a father to father me. And the scripture tells us this, beloved. Paul said this, you may have 10,000 instructors, people give you all kinds of advice, but you had not many fathers. And, and, and what's happening with this generation, the Bible says in the Malachi, the latter chapter, how the hearts of the children will be turned back, or the hearts of the father will be turned back to the children. We have a generation where children or, or men are not being fathered. And by them not being father, what are they doing? A lot of them are acting like women. They have identity crisis. They don't know who they are no longer because they had no one to test their life and to father them. And as my personal testimony went, beloved, neither did I. But I didn't go on the other side because I gave my heart to Christ at a young age and he became my father. See, a father's responsibility, beloved, talking about, Lord, teach me how to pray, is to show a young man, a boy, how to become a man, how to become a father, to be an example in his home. That's the father's responsibility. The father's responsibility is also to show his daughter what a man should look like, a good man should look like. And when you don't have a father in your home, you don't have balance in your life. When you have a mother that's trying to play the, that's playing the mother role of teaching the children and taking care of the household, now she's doing two jobs. She's doing the father's job and she's doing her own personal job. So life isn't really out of balance. So her children become out of balance because it takes two, a father and a mother in order to raise up a healthy family so that the family in the time that we're living in don't become a dysfunctional family. It's not functioning the way God had planned it. For in the beginning he made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and not Eve and another female. But he made male and female and he told them to be fruitful and to multiply. So when we think about praying, beloved, Jesus told us what not to do and he told us how to pray. And the thing that we want to point out more than anything, beloved, is that when you go before the king, you don't want to go God by yourself. You want Jesus to go before you. You know, you want the scepter to be pointed out or to be pointed out to you and told you to come forward. But we must always pray in the name of Jesus. In John 16, 23 and 24, 
Jesus said, Here with two have you asked nothing in my name. He said, Ask that it may given, uh, be given unto you, so that your joy might be filled. So this is one of the principles. Now, as I foresaid in my early um, statement in Romans 8, 26, it says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay? We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself in the seas for us uh, with groaning, moaning and groaning that can't be other. other. In other words, I don't really know how to pray. I don't know how to express my heart to God. But through the Holy Spirit, it helps me. It interprets my heart to the heart of my Father that's in, that says in heaven. Alright, so you ought to pray in the Spirit. You ought to pray in the name of Jesus. Then he tells us what not to do. He said when you pray in Matthew 6 and 5, don't pray like the hypocrites are do. They pray so that they can be heard. And sometimes, beloveds, you don't really have a prayer life, but you go to church and somebody, or a pastor, one of the leaders asks you to pray. Now you have, you, you, you're so full of words. But the Bible says that when you pray like that, you pray like the hypocrites. Because really you don't talk to God at all unless they call on you to pray at church and you're doing it only to be seen. So he said, when you pray, don't pray like that, beloveds. Okay? The third thing in Matthew 6 and 6, he says, you ought to have a secret closet. You ought to have a time that you can steal away in prayer. I understand your name of prayer is good, but the Bible said we ought to pray for one another. We ought to confess our faults to one another so that we could be healed. But sometimes Jesus stole away for prayer. He, he got away from the disciples. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane, beloved, which represent the hour of being crushed. Because you cannot have an hour, you cannot have that Holy Ghost anointing unless the soul is broken down. For the Bible said that a broken and contrite heart, God won't despise. So your heart has to be broken up when you come before God. So you have to have that secret place, a place where you go and you shut out everything. What I mean by shutting out everything, 